Ralph here once again, and it is January 16th, 11.31 p.m., a little earlier than we normally do these reports. But first, let's get right into the data analytics. The one first thing I want to show you basically is the information we compiled in reference to second vaccine deliveries. Now, obviously, you know, we've been keeping track of this information from the very beginning as we look at our dates here. Now, the reason this is pertinent is because we're looking at data reporting. And if every vaccine was administered logistically with pure efficiency, then basically by the second dose being delivered, this would be the population percentage that should be vaccinated. 8%, 7.6%, so on and so forth. Alaska, 15 and New York, which is 4.79%. That's if all the second doses, first dose and second dose, were administered with logistical efficiency. But the reason that's important or of interest is because we look at this, for example, we're going back to uh, our world and data. They're looking at the United States as only being 0.49% of the population being vaccinated. And this is where you get into confounding reference to data. So you have a couple of uh, hypotheses we can have here, or well, I could refer to it as conspiracies. So if you only have a 0.49% distribution rate as of January 16th, whoops, I just no clue where I just went. Oh, this bigger chart. Cool. All right. And so basically then what is, is happening, for example, we go back to our data that we collected here, to basically enough vaccines being administered, this is the second dose being administered, of, enough to cover this percentage of the population with the corresponding state. By the way, if you notice too, with extreme logistical efficiency, look how basically each, uh, this is obviously our information as of January 15th, each uh, basically logistic delivery of the second dose of vaccines, first and second, is pretty uniform across the board. All right, but we're going to get back to that information in a second. Let's get back right into the pertinent news of the last seven days in reference to SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, however you want to word it. This one I like a lot. Another common cold virus. All right. What they're doing is looking at basically other viruses and the patterns that they followed over time. Now, keep in mind also too, as people age and they're exposed to the virus when they're younger, uh, they're going to have some innate immunity as they get older. So, you know, a 16-year-old that gets exposed to it 10 years down the road is going to have innate immunity, and you may have this type of effect. I don't want to add publisher bias. Because the researchers are trying to stress right here is, in not-so-popular terms, stay safe until it reaches this point. All right, so to say. But here we are. It's been about one year. Remember in this first chart, it give us 15 days to flatten the curve. Trust us. Just give up all your civil liberties for 15 days. Throw this thing over your face and let's see what happens. All right. You get my slant on that. Meaning we all could be wrong. And it could be wrong again and wrong again and wrong again. It's supposed to be done to be Easter, this and that, and so on and so forth. So with the best information we have available, this is what looking at. Remember, we have two y-axis is here we have y-axis one we have y-axis two y-axis one we're looking at the infection fortality ratio y-axis two proportion of primary infections so here we go and this looks pretty accurate the numeric numbers look really really low but when you look at the actual totals on the news and so on and so forth uh, from morning noon and night uh obviously you can tell it has a different impact we're looking at totals as far as as opposed to percentages so here we have infection fortality ratio. And right here, they're estimated by two years, prior to the time that all the vaccines are rolled out. You're going to look at this, and your infection fortality ratio is going to be basically that of seasonal flu. Now look what happens as we get four years, six years, eight years. Now, if that model runs true, uh, by six and eight years it's going to be fairly superfluous uh, and with or without vaccination by that time. Now, keep in mind the vaccines at this time, if on the outstretch are about 
a year of some sort of immunity uh, helping with the immune system. I don't want to use the word immunity uh, because to use the word immunity is to propose that you have like some sort of 100% immunity. Offer some immunity is a better way of saying it, 15%, 20%, 30%, 95%, whatever it is. But to say immune totally is a black and white term. So here we are about two years, four years, six years, and so on and so forth. And again, I'll have the links for all these studies so you can look on your own. And this is going to play a role down the line. So four, six, eight years down the road, uh, you know, just like MERS, SARS, COV-1, uh, Ebola, no, don't take Ebola back because Ebola is right there. So that's a bad, bad one to use. The transmissibility is low, but no, no, you don't want to get infected with Ebola. But, you know, as far as MERS, SARS, COV-2, and so, so forth, uh, it can go down that route, potentially. So, here we go. A nice tool been researched recently in reference to helping potentially uh, in treating SARS-CoV-2. So, what we're looking at here is limonene. You notice lemons? You notice the oranges? Limonene is something that's normally found in citrus fruits, which is a really interesting trend here. You notice a lot of the food items, I don't even want to call it nutraceuticals because it's not really nutraceuticals per se. It's something that should be in, in a basic diet. Do play a huge role in helping combat SARS-CoV-2. So let's get into the research here. This is where we're going. Among numerous phytochemicals, Limonene, a dietary terpene of natural origin, has been recently shown to target viral proteins in the in silico studies. Limonene is one of the main compounds identified in many citrus plants available and accessible in diets and well studied for therapeutic benefits due to dietary nature. Please forgive me. I'm going to speak a little fast because we have a lot of ground to cover. And these videos normally go about 50 minutes now. Relative safety and efficacy along with favorable Physiochemical properties. Limonene has been suggested to be a fascinating candidate for further investigation in COVID-19. Limonene shown to modulate numerous signaling pathways and inhibits inflammatory mediators, including cytokines, cytokine storms, remember that, chemokines, adhesion molecules, prostanoids, and eco ecosinoids, eco I want eco ecocannabinoids, ecosinoids. We hypothesized that given the pathogenesis of COVID-19 involving infection, inflammation, immunity, limiting may have a potential to limit the severity and regression of the disease owing to its immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory antiviral properties. There is one more interesting aspect in reference to limiting, which gives it a huge uh, dimensional benefit that is not mentioned here in this part of the abstract. So, Again, go, let's find it, the information. Do, 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 speed read, speed read, speed read, speed reading. Ba ba, here we are. All right. This is going to play a role here. All right, you see right there, treating depression. Because right here, in reference to here, you see depression, stress could dampen efficacy of, um, let's just go right there. You see that? Of COVID 19 vaccines. So, am I saying eat a few lemons and oranges before you get vaccinated? Hmm, maybe, but let's begin. All right, the psychological distress is linked with immune and inflammatory responses and suggests that psychoneuroimmunity can be important in COVID-19 infections. Many of the EO, EOs are known for relieving stress, treating depression, and aiding with insomnia. Subsequently, limonene and its metabolites have been shown useful in alleviating depression, anxiety, stress, mediating anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, and antioxidant, antioxidant properties. Mechanically, antidepressant activities were shown to mediate gamma amino butyric acid, mono aminergic, aminergic, uh, mono aminergic, I have what the heck, right? neurotrophic mechanisms and evidence by inhibition of hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis hyperactivity and the reduction of mono amino transmitter levels. So interesting, you don't normally think about that as far as a citrus fruit that could possibly have a benefit in reference to stress and anxiety and depression. Uh, but it may play a role. And again, this is a wonderful, wonderful study. And in reference to the hypothesis of why limiting should be a candidate for research in reference to SARS-CoV-2. But you know what? The benefits that it brings forward regardless are pretty darn cool. Again, the links will be there for you. I'll have it. This is all stuff covered within the past few days. All right, now, this is really interesting. 
Now, this is going to play a role in a few other aspects, too. And some of you may forget from 2010, some of the research reference to flu vaccines. We're going to cover that in a second. New study. Without right messaging, masks could lead to more COVID-19 spread. What they discovered was the major, major key factor right here. The key risk factor in driving transmission of the disease, the study found, was the number of daily contacts participants had with other adults and seniors. Those who wore masks had more daily contacts compared to those who did not, and a higher proportion of contracted the virus contracted contacted contracted the virus as a result. Basic phys- uh, psychology could be at work, said the researchers. Uh, when you wear a mask, you may have de- you may have a deceptive sense of being protected and have more interactions with other people. All right, a lot of people over embellish the benefits of masks because masks became like this tribal thing where everyone began to, you know, say, I can identify your political affiliation, how you are, da da da, but whether you're participating in mask wearing or not. To me, it's a courtesy thing. You know, I'm not, the, I, I don't have the time to fight people on whether they want to wear a mask or not. At the same time, I don't like to. But however, though, if someone's scared and afraid, you know what? I'll be compassionate. And I will put that mask on just to make them feel better. And of course, the second I get away, obviously, I'll probably take it off. But you know what I mean. But still, I don't like the fighting that goes on with this. But but this is an important article. I digress. Because with the right red virus messaging, it could lead to more COVID-19 spread. What does this play a role? All right. Let's just bring it up, for example, in current events. But um, how many of you have seen the National Guard hanging out? at you know basically the capital and you see these pictures over and over again and the reason this brings up an interesting aspect is the fact is it's not, this one i dislike a lot and you t- trust me i am really really peeved in representing national guard being forced to sleep on a marble floor uh when i think a lot you know a lot of better, better ways to treat our individuals who are serving a little bit better. Like, freaking, where the heck are the cots? Why can't they have, I mean, if you're forcing people to sleep on the floor, but again, why can't you at least make it comfortable for them? Where the heck are sleeping bags or anything like that? This is a freaking hard marble floor. But think of the infection potential. And it's not so much the hypocrisy. It's the fact is, I don't don't I mean don't focus on hypocrisy. I honestly believe that these particular individuals truly don't believe things are the way they are, and I'll leave you to interpret uh, what I actually mean by that. Because, tell you quite honestly, if you're looking at trying to protect the president and the Congress and everyone else like that, whether you have rioters in there or National Guard. And you know when the transmission rate of COVID-19, it was discussed before, is 100% on the floor? And just bottom line, the way you're treating people that serve is not cool. But now to the next aspect in reference to why this is important. Another one that we looked at back in 2010, yeah, I've been doing this a long, long time, is this is the flu vaccine, changing human social behavior in response to a common vaccine. It's been pretty much done over and over again. Vaccines can alter human behavior. And I like this vaccine from 2010. Doesn't mean the vaccine, this COVID vaccine is going to do it. But it could play a role in this study here. But it's fairly important. The purpose of the study was to test the hypothesis that exposure to a directly transmitted human pathogen, flu virus. Guys, this was 2010, right? Right there, yeah. Uh, flu virus, now we're dealing with coronavirus, increases now 2009 was, that SARS-CoV-1? Yeah, increases human social behavior. Presymptomatically, this hypothesis grounded empirical evidence that animals infected with pathogens rarely behave like uninfected animals. And in an evolutionary theory as applied to infectious disease, such behavioral changes have the potential to increase parasite transmission and or solicitation of care. All right, so what was the results of their study? 
was as follows. Human social behavior does indeed change with exposure. Compared to the 48 hours pre-exposure, participants interacted significantly more people and in significantly larger groups during the 48 hours immediately post-exposure. Post-exposure being the vaccine. The results show that there is an immediate act. That this has nothing to do with being anti-vaccine, pro-vaccine. It's just this is just science. The research did not. You know, we're not taking sides. Just taking facts. These results show that this is an immediate active behavioral response to infection before their expected onset of symptoms or sickness behavior, although they adapted symptoms of the findings for their investigation. We anticipate with advanced ecological and evolutionary understanding, human pathogen interactions will have implications for effective disease epidemiology and prevention. And interesting as far as um, uh, what they did. Uh, see, in their exposure, before you go, oh, well, it's an infection. I must have read that. No. No point source exposure to form of influenza virus immunization. And they compared the social behavior before and after exposures. And this was big in the news in 2010. So yeah, vaccines tend to make individuals, for whatever reason, more social. Masks may make people more social as well. And that plays a role in spreading the disease. Uh, you know, my hypothesis in reference to mask, if people were more concerned about their health as opposed to putting something over their face, per se, especially after all this time, I think we could have mitigated this pandemic a long time ago just by eating healthy, healthy behavior, so on and so forth. But, however, again, I digress. So please don't get mad at me. All right, but here's the next thing. In reference to the vaccine itself, these are all interesting aspects, and this goes full circle now to the limiting. Because depression and stress could dampen the efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine. Now, what the researchers are doing here is they're saying, basically, if you're going to get vaccinated, obviously try to be in a good mood. They're saying it may be possible to reduce the negative effects with simple steps like exercise and sleep. So generally, they're saying to get the most out of the vaccine, you know, Ironically, <laughs> the irony is this. A lot of these behaviors, remember the healthy user scenario reference to vac- the flu vaccine a long time ago. The, they showed the flu vaccine worked and they discovered later on the confounding was that people were more likely to be vaccinated, tend to partake in healthier behaviors. That was called the healthy user um, hypothesis. But otherwise, outside of that, a lot of the behaviors which would be kind of cool to have are also great for mitigating the uh, virus itself. But my point is not to put publish your bias on it my point is basically say hey you know what a little bit of exercise a good night's sleep before you get vaccinated not a bad idea another aspect too which russia researcher came up with russian russian researcher uh something which should be brought to light is as follows should you avoid alcohol when getting a coronavirus vaccine the hypothesis again all because something is said with confidence doesn't mean it's true it just means it makes a good hypothesis. And the researcher said as follows. Drinking alcohol if getting a coronavirus vaccine could significantly blunt the immune response and potentially render the vaccine ineffective. Now, we're already having a vaccine with questionable effectiveness. All of them. The mRNA ones, the vector, so on and so forth. And who knows if there could be antigenic drift or, or antigenic uh, drift or whatever it's going to be that can possibly throw a, a wrench in there. But most viruses when they hit the wild they want to really focus on transmissibility and as far as not hurting its uh, host as much so most often they mutate into highly transmissible but less lethal so most often i'm not saying this is the case of the coronavirus here but still uh render the vaccine effective da 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 and who's developing the vaccine the first one the warning doesn't just apply to the sputnik 5 this is the russian vaccine obviously but all covid 19 vaccines and indeed all other vaccines so another hint besides exercise and sleep got there is basically don't drink Another aspect, too, which I don't have the article here, is sometimes medications like acetaminophen can also dampen the effects of a vaccine if you want to get the most out of the vaccine, so on and so forth. And it's real important for that overall. And also, too, 
Did I bring up the light in reference to this, which is also, uh, bring this back. Yeah, here we go. I didn't get a chance to cover this, but here I want to read this one paragraph as well. Reinfection is possible within one year, but even if it occurs, symptoms are mild and the virus is clear from the body more quickly. It highlights the need to tease apart the components of immunity to SARS-CoV-2. How long does immunity that prevents, this is the part here, how long does immunity that prevents pathology last and how long does immunity that prevents transmission last? Those durations may be very different. And that, of course, played a role in the future of SARS-CoV-2, which their model says it's going to be no news. Hopefully, the faster it's no news, the better, but at least by year 2.3. And then, of course, we get into the COVID vaccine thing, and we are going to get into the data that right now we're about to present. All right, let's begin. There we go. That's all the news. Now we're going to data analytics for those that are still here uh, 21 minutes later. And I'm going to run through this pretty fast because a lot of this is kind of redundant. We've seen it before. Initially, we was trying to find correlations between age and population density and so on and so forth. It just wasn't, nothing was showing up. So I don't want to, I don't want to keep on, you know, going over that over and over again. So here we go. All right. Vaccine deliveries and shipments. Remember what we're doing here in data analytic aspect is we're basing our information right here on the second shipments totals. So this is the total of all the second shipments. If everything was administered appropriately, appropriately or fluidly, I should say, as of then remember this is the week of January 18th, even though it's January 16th. Then basically, for example, as a population uh, overall, we should be looking at this much of the population effectively receiving the second dose of the mRNA one, uh, either from uh, basically Pfizer or Moderna. So here we go. Look down the line here. Our date is as of January 15th. I guess it was the last report. This is to uh, percentage of inpatient bed utilization to IC bed utilization. We are going to, you and I, what we're going to do is be following the data in reference to the vaccines as far as to see if it's going to make a difference at all in hospitalizations or ICU. Now, the confounding, obviously, is that with coronavirus, uh, putting off a lot of elective surgeries, you can have that effect where the hospitals are equally as full as they are, even if the vaccine, for example, is working, because all of a sudden elective surgeries are opened up and people are now taking those surgeries and then the ICU beds are filled up again and hospital beds, so on and so forth. So here we are, percentage of inpatient bed utilization, percentage of ICU bed utilization, vaccine level. So this is basically each state. This green bar represents the second uh, total dose of vaccines since the very beginning up to the week of this week, January 18th, 2021. There is our ICU bed utilization. Alabama is pretty close to max, for example. California, right there, and so on and so forth. And let's run down the line here. This is our vaccine distribution. Now, if you notice the pink right there, there was one aspect where they just unloaded a ton of these second doses. You see right there? So that was December 21st, right before Christmas. And then if you look at it, it's looking at a pretty strong uniform distribution. Uh, all the way across the board. Again, we'll be following through and keep in check in reference to the vaccine administration. Overall, on our own very amateur data analytic aspect, I don't know what APIs are using. I don't know half the information where these bureaucrats get their information from because they're not, they're not getting it from actual science reporting. And that's my rant to that. Hospital occupancy. All right, here we go. Let's get right to the top real fast. We can scroll down. Do, 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 do. All right, because the reason this is important because a lot of people were locking things down, having martial law, whatever they want to call it, just curfews, so on and so forth. So here we are. And so you want to double check the information. And that it gives you a little bit knowledge is power. Knowledge is also freedom. And if someone's messing with your freedom and you have the knowledge that they're messing with it, that's that's something you should know. All right, total inpatient beds, blue. All right, inpatient beds used, orange. Inpatient beds used for COVID green. All right, there's your data right there. 
do, do, do. And you notice it's interesting because now we're looking at, you know, this is total. Let's go, look, let's go back down to something else. I was about to say percentage, but these are totals. So obviously, Rhode Island, even though most of their beds are pretty much full, which we'll get to in a second, you know, they don't have as many beds. So we're looking at total numbers. Total ICU beds uh, estimated. And here, remember, Florida, we're using as a control for infection rates and so on and so forth. So IC beds used. And traditionally, how many IC beds, ICU beds are used? Well, normally it's about 76% anyways. But here we go. There we are, right there. Patient percent of injured bed, I should say, in bed utilization. I take that back. And so I think I think we put it on the 72% line here, just to give a little bit of margin. And these are the uh, the blue line here would be basically inpatient bed utilization above the standard 72%, which is normally historical. And remember we covered last week too, they've been closing a lot of hospitals down for whatever reason. So these numbers can change dramatically depending on the hospitals that are available. Why they're closing hospitals down and laying off healthcare workers? Again, uh, why don't, I don't want to make this hypothesis hour. Not my hypothesis. I want other hypothesi. And so there we are. Uh, patients, uh, percentage of patient beds with COVID. You see, there's certain areas right there. California has been like really high uh, comparatively. So you have California here, Arizona here as a percentage. Doesn't mean they're not fighting the virus well or not mitigating it well. It just means they may not have as many beds. So here we are. Uh, look at that. I'm just going to scroll through real fast. This chart for those which are into data analytics, you see right there, the staffing. This is all important, but I don't want to make this a four-hour video. All right, here we go. These are the columns. This is our California bed, inpatient beds, inpatient beds used. Right there. So there we are. Look, how, look how steady this is. Now, obviously, we do have an increase in COVID patients here, right? But, you know, you know what changed between here and there if it's the same number of inpatient beds being used practically? Um, I think the overkill, personally myself, in reference to the, to the curfews and other aspects like that, um, Looking at this data, what do you think? All right, let's look. Da, da, da. New York, there's, you got the blue, meaning for the availability. Orange, beds used. Green, COVID. Uh, Florida, mm, see right there, look at that. Now keep up, Florida's our test case. Our, not test case, our control. The, as much as we can make it a control, it's our control. And Florida seems to be doing pretty well. People said the world would be coming to an end, but it hasn't for Florida. So let's go to do, do do. Let's go to COVID state testing. Right here we go. Boom, boom, boom. Now this, I, I try to give a little bit of interesting uh, aspect from my very, very amateur, humble, that analytic way of uh, something new. And what we're going to do is we are going to look at a predictive model, meaning I'm going to give you the number. And because the correlation between total test results and mortality is so correlated that I'm just going to give you the numbers. For every 10,000 tests, this should this should be the mortality uh, predicted. And we'll show you that in a second. There's our correlation line. Again, I'm still waiting for an explanation. Six weeks later, death and total test results. Total test results, for those that are familiar, include your negative and your positive. Look at that. That's amazing. That's California. All right, here we go. Correlation of right now currently a 0.985. All right, here we go. Da, da, da. Old news. Um, old news. I mean, it's current the data, but however, though, again, we've covered it before. This is just me, uh, you know, smoothing out the curve. All right, here again. Remember, we look at this total test result increase, positive increase. So basically, we're looking at that right there as far as our comparisons. And red is the test increase. Blue is the positive increases. You see? And of course, I showed you this before. Blue here is your positive increase. Red here is your mortality. I don't like using the word death. Um, mortality, I prefer uh, for other reasons. Uh, 
because I think death tends to, I mean, does have, tend to have a, a, a stronger connotation. Mortality is more clinical in its aspect. Uh, positive to mortality. Again, we have red mortality. There it is. And your positive increase. You have two axes here. Keep that in mind. You have Y axis number one. And there's your mortality rate. And it is right up there. And positive increase. That's there. And this is for, again, uh, basically just to give you an idea. I think that was California. Yeah, it's California. And so this right here, that keep in mind, I wanted to show you this just to give you an idea how charts can be deceptive. It's the exact same chart. It says the exact same thing. Right there, you see the blue is your positive increase right there and red is your death increase the exact same chart when i put it like this on two axes there's your mortality increase there's your positive increase i just want to give you an idea how manipulative data analytics can be to the person consuming that information if done in a negative light all right, let's go basically do this. Do, do, do numbers, 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 numbers. All right, here's our correlation. Test results, mortality correlation. All right, there's our total test results. Correlation, that was a predictive model I did before, but I just want to show something different anyways. Again, the correlation was so strong, we could actually predict the slope, but this time for the slope, I decided to put an OLS model. And our OLS model, for example, here we go. Look where to go. No, that's not it. Ba, ba, ba. Where is the one I did? Here, that's our correlation. I want to get to that in a second. Total test result plus correlation. That's mortality. That's the positive to mortality. Model seems to be pretty solid. But however, though, projected death. Now we're getting towards that. There's our least squares model. You don't have to know what that means. There's our population, merging groups. There's our data frame, data frame, data frame, big data frame. There's our heat map. I want to pass over that. All right. There's that. Now, we're, here we're going to go. Ready? This is what we're looking at. You see our correlations here? I have this model set up to where we're going to look at basically the first few states as far as the heat maps are concerned. That is a correlation for those not familiar, and there's a new numbers to put into a list for you, is death to total test results. Our data scientists out there would appreciate this. Total test results. I'm not saying total positive test results, total test results. Why would you have a 0.9975? See what I mean? Now let's look at the data here. To list. I'm showing the homework. So basically those information in the people that uh, that are uh, familiar with data analytics and programming in Python can see what I've done just by pausing it. Here we go. I'm running a loop. Here's our correlations. Estimated mortality per 10,000 test. So basically what we're looking at, if and when North Carolina does 10,000 tests, there'd be 9.08 poor souls that perished. If that correlation holds at 0.9975, now obviously as the correlation begins to drop, you're going to have more of a uh, more of a variance. But here we are, Virginia, 0.9.06, Georgia. So if they do 10,000 tests, right, the mortality should be 18.9 individuals higher for the next 10,000 tests. There is our mortality per test utilizing the correlation information that we have available. So if you want to look at it and check it out, go for it. We could come back next week if they do 10,000 tests by then. I'm sure they will. But we could break it down per 10,000 tests to dip. There's our list right there. I'm going to run through it real slow. Don't mind me. I don't know what that flash was, but don't mind me. There's that. That line. And then more data frames. So on and so forth. And what do we got here? Let's just let's come back to this in a second because I what did I do here? Slope the parameters, so fit. Uh, erase that. When we come back to the kernel in a second, the kernel. Come back to the the notebook in a second, and I'm just gonna run all cells real fast. There we go. 
All right, now let's go to the world data, which is equally as important. We'll come back to this in a second. All right, world data as follows. For expediency, let's just run through real fast. This is new cases smooth per million, new deaths smooth per million. On a global scale, it's barely noticeable, especially on this type of chart. Uh, percentage of positive cases, slight increase. Um, again, it could be a seasonal effect. But however, though, let's go down the list. Do, 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 do. Sweden as our control. Sweden did very little down on a mass level. They did go to a one, so they suggested it in certain cases, but they did not say it's but no longer a zero. But here we are. Sweden is purple, and we're comparing to Great Britain and the United States. And here's what we're looking at. We're now looking at basically saying, hey, Sweden is doing is bad. But Sweden has done virtually nothing as far as pandemic mitigation. And now you have to tell me, has it made a difference? And we're looking at a case of smooth per million. So we're comparing apples to apples the best we can. Uh, you know, taking there could be other confounding involved, but, you know, healthier population, potentially so on and so forth. But overall, and if that was the case, then that's a huge hint. Uh, they've done virtually nothing. We've done everything. And the case is, if you're going to achieve the exact same results without uh, locking people down, isolating them in, uh, in long-term care facilities, creating panic and shutting the schools down, if all of, I mean, yeah, we've done that, but none of it ever made a difference. And Sweden, being our control, is still achieving better results per million. What would you do as a global leader? All right, here we go. And new deaths per million. And of course, then look at our Asian friends. It's like amazing. It literally is just incredible. Here is Sweden. Uh, again, we're looking at Sweden right here, purple right there. So there's that USA lockdown. And so they went up and they went down. And there's the United States. And that's as of the 15th of January. And so deaths smooth per million. Sweden went up. And then it goes down. Now, again, the numbers look like this. New deaths USA. This is on a total level, on a population level. This is not apples to apples. This is not a fair comparison. Uh, and then we go so far and so forth all the way down the line. All right, let's go back to this. Let's say testing. Let's see if anything come yep, came up yet. All right, scrolling down, scrolling down. If I find anything of interest, they'll stop. But please follow along with me as I scan through here. There's a, the heat maps are random. I, I randomize them so we get different things each time. There's our correlations. And wonderfully enough, is a freaking heck. So there now it's whatever it took out is not working appropriately. So I'm not going to bother doing that. More telling that this up. What happened there? Where did it come from? There. We'll come back to that again. A right, second. All right, here we go. Da, 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 investigate. Now we'll look at the world mask levels. Here we go. World mask. Now look at each state as far as what they're doing. Here we are. And this thing's bouncing around. Do, 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 do. All right, so this is the world mask, and this is updated as of the 16th. The tenth for the mask for Zimbabwe, for example, the sixteenth for the uh, the COVID effects. So here we go. Yeah, the, so for example, using tenth, you know, whenever the last reporting was, how accurate I can say Afghanistan, place like that, I don't know. Uh, our correlation in regards to facial coverings, uh, if obviously one is facial coverings, the facial coverings. Uh, is really hasn't changed much if we're losing facial coverings as there. I regret I should be adding social distancing in there to be a little better, just a curiosity, but I'm not seeing anything really there uh, per se. All right, let's scroll down. Da -da. And there's our all the places in the world which are at a four. And then we go down here, see Sweden's at a one. 
And remember, zero is no policy. One is recommended. Two is required in certain areas. Again, a lot of countries that I thought were actually be higher than a two uh, are not, like New Zealand, the Netherlands, and so on and so forth, and Germany, and Philippines, and Fiji. Uh, you would think would be higher. In Russia, now they're at a two. Uh, it's only these countries which are at fours. And so three, required in shared public spaces. And then obviously four, which we just covered at the top. These locations we covered, United States. If we see anything interesting, I'll stop. Uh, masks look superfluous in reference to that. And again, I don't want to this. I don't want to be stuck on the mask aspect. I want to look at other pandemic mitigation. But the thing that really gets me about the mask, again, is the fact is we focus so much on that that I worry to distract us from other possibly more beneficial mitigation aspects. If we didn't have a mask, for example, would a person take better care of themselves in another way? Uh, you know, would we have restaurants open that served healthy food? as opposed to corralling everyone into fast food establishments. You know, it's just little aspects like that. Would we have changed our strategy if we just didn't become so focused on what we put over our mouths? All right, there's the mass levels. Remember, Sweden went to a one. And there we go there. Sweden, there is that. Colombia, da, 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 Japan. People think it's like really high, but they went up to a three at one time and then went back down. See so if there's anything noticing, New Zealand, Red line is your um, deaths per million. Do you want to give you an idea? Cases, New Zealand really has not been touched pretty much. Finland, they went up to a mass level of two, uh, as we discussed before. And then India, uh, it's been there. But again, compliance has been really interesting with India. Uh, Spain, they were going out of control for a while. France, remember Yellow Jackets and so on and so forth. They're on the verge of rebellion. It was going up there like that, boom, boom, boom. And then look what happened and just dropped. Interesting. Because the reason being is the case of million is the seasons. So I, when it's important to say, well, maybe it has something to do with, you know, more of a seasonal thing. Uh, it doesn't seem to correlate effectively with that. Uh, there we go again. This is a test per. Look at now. Look at the CT. The, the test even skyrocketed, and even with additional testing, it didn't bring out more cases. Not like, for example, the United States and other places like that. Uh, mass level. Uh, the United Kingdom goes crazy. Mass don't appear to be do a thing right there, um, and so on and so forth. And there's Italy and more numbers and so on and so forth. All right, states. The state's going to be important because what we are going to do is we are going to use Florida as a Florida, Florida is as our um, as our control. So let's just get past all this mortality increase. Here we are. Remember, this is in scientific notation, and so positive per hundred thousand. There is the again. It's not so much whether they're doing the beating each other. The fact is, when you have California, and New York doing this uh, pandemic lockdowns and you have a control like Florida, which obviously the positive were 100,000, a lot less. That could be less testing, so on and so forth, whatever. But regardless of that, you're destroying people's lives economically, you're damaging education, so on and so forth. Why? That's, it's like if, it, if your controls are, are outperforming the basically those, those which are doing the pandemic mitigation, why? All right, deaths per 100,000, you know, Florida. And I would be willing to side with the science if I saw the data support it. And again, data is vital because it also tells you that a lot of the media has been playing games with your head. All right, so here we go. Deaths increased per 100,000, da da da. And this is why we do the data analytics. Do it yourself. Confirm my information. Prove me wrong. I mean, I don't mind. I'll change my, my hypothesis in reference to the numerical data. If you provide maybe different numerical data, there's that. And positive increases per state. Look at California. And there's Texas and there's New York. That's numerical. All right, let's go back to the COVID testing. Let's see if it's ran through again one more time. If not, we're going to skip it for the night. Do, 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 do. Look at how small that thing is there. It goes. There's that. And yeah, there's our correlations. 
because North Carolina, look, see the, the, the correlation. Uh, total test results to total test results is obviously one. Total test results to death. Seriously? That's why I said you could, it's so easy you could predict it exactly along those lines. Uh, North Carolina, North Carolina, mortality percentage of positive increase, drop. North Carolina again. Virginia, uh, hospitalized currently. You're again, your mortality percentage for positive increase, which actually looks like a decrease. Scroll down. Please forgive me if I'm moving kind of fast. I want to try to get done in the next five minutes. Uh, mortality percentage decrease. Look, a little bit of increase. I wonder why. There's that. And there's Georgia. Nice heat map. But look, total test results to death. Mortality, I should say. Huh? And that's, I think, our top three. Here's California, which I'm only pulling up because I live here. And mortality percentages. Interesting. Uh, again, there's that. New York. Again, everyone experienced a little bit of an increase uh, in those states. There's the heat map. And then Florida. So on and so forth. Florida, Florida, Florida. Florida's our control. And look at this. Now, again, Florida's being the control. Even though they have a, still have the same correlation, for example, let's we'll get the heat map in a second. The mortality percentage per positive is not going up the same as our other two. Um, I would call them uh, sister brother states or other uh, companion states. Compare it to other. That's going to be politically correct. It is not the same effect on the companion states. We look at the mortality percentage increases. Here's New York. And uh, again, there's Florida. And then if we look again at basically, you know, at the increase, you know, California already saw. But you get the idea. And there's our correlation still. It works about the same and so on and so forth. So that's what we're looking at. And now let's go to, 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 to world data we did, investigated data, COVID states. I believe we covered already. Yep, we did that. Uh, hospital occupancy we did. And we did back to this, the vaccine distribution. So there we are in reference to that. Also, too, before I bring up a point, uh, this is the second dose shipment and so on and so forth. I forgot to cover this as well. Another aspect that's important, new say without masks can be, it can be vital. The mask can give a false sense of security and obviously re result in uh, more contacts. But also as well, too, still the debate about masks has not been complete. The last study that we had, obviously, was from doo -doo -doo, was from this one here. And their conclusion was December 29th, 2020. Uh, looking at 739 citations. Their conclusion was Mask use versus no mask is a small, non-statistically significant reduction. And that was not the conclusion. The conclusion was this. Basically, therefore, evidence for various comparisons about mask use in healthcare settings and risk for SARS-CoV-2 remains insufficient. So that's like adding insult to injury. And this is what I'm trying to say. I don't know where bureaucrats are getting their information because obviously – you know, looking at 739 citations and the Annals of Internal Medicine are not agreeing with a lot of the popular belief. Again, mask use could be a courtesy uh, to some individuals. Uh, now, I don't care. But the, whether I actually believe in mask being an effective mitigation strategy, I it's not whether I believe it or not. The question is, I got to find data in a real world setting that rationalizes it and does not even compound it by potentially making it worse because of masks, for example, are found because the virus is submicronized or are dip below three microns or four microns and basically your breathing is slowed by a mask at below 15 liters a minute and that causes more nasal deposition. You know, we covered that before. So if, for example, adding insult to injury, if the masks are questionable in its effectiveness, and then you have individuals feeling more confident socially and then they interact more because they're wearing their mask, or you have situations like this, which I found atrocious, uh, 
yeah, you could be contributing to it. And of course, we covered before aerosolization, having testing centers where everyone's driving into. You remember the whole game. But again, let's go through what we covered. All right, let's start right here. Do, 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 do. We covered basically the discrepancies between the second vaccine distribution and basically the amount of people that have actually been vaccinated should be about close to 8% or 7% of the United States should be there if everything was basically administered effectively. Uh, we covered the fact that basically alcohol can blunt the effect of just about any vaccine or make a vaccine totally ineffective. So if you're worried about side effects or reactions, don't drink because if you have to get vaccinated again because you nullify the vaccine because of drinking, why? Depression and stress have an impact in reference to also depleting uh, the effectiveness of the vac, depleting, diminishing the effectiveness of the vaccine. Uh, old news, which I covered back in 2010, that the flu virus of immunization makes people more social. Therefore, through viral shedding, which did not cover, uh, can result in increasing greater viral transmissibility. Yeah, this is how can I mean, seriously? How can you be a politician and just walk by people? Say, you know, no, that's just wrong. Cots, sleeping bags, tents. This this better not be the the way of the way we treat people at any time, especially with those who are supposed to be defending them. All right, we covered that though. Masks without the right messaging could lead to a greater spread. All right, we covered that. Limonene, a potential ally in basically mitigating the effects of SARS-CoV-2. Again, some citrus fruits, lemons or oranges and other citrus fruits like that. Uh, I have the link for you. And lastly, been two, three years from now, uh, hopefully people be going SARS COV what? Again, Ralph Trichano signing off. All the links will be there for you to follow. Um, I guess I'll catch y'all next week. I'll try to make it a little faster each time and add a little bit more fun in reference to um, not fun. I should take that back. A little bit more engaging in reference to looking at pandemic meditation data and so on and so forth. In this case, the main thing here, which I'll leave you with real fast if I can get to it, is the correlations per state uh, in reference to tests per 10,000 tests in predictive mortality. And if it pans out appropriately, um, these figures should be right on target. Here we are, estimate mortality per 10,000 tests. And if you do that for your own home state, for example, let's go down this real fast, and it comes out to be pretty accurate per 10,000 tests, let me know. Because again, it's the greatest mystery I've seen so far is any correlation between total tests and mortality. Again, Ralph signing off. Hope you enjoyed tonight if you're here with me to this fast 53 minutes. Thank you, gratitude, and I'll see you all on the regular uh, research recover on Tuesday, or I'll see you again Saturday or Sunday morning, whatever it is right now. It's actually kind of early for us. This should be in 4K. Last time what we did with Loom, I did not do 4K, did 720. Uh, hopefully everything is clear and not so hard on your eyes. All right, catch you all in a bit. And Ralph signing off and see you all later on. All right, catch you in a bit. Bye.